Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tony Gaffney. I'm CEO at the Vector AI Institute here in Toronto, and I'm accompanied by uh, several members of our leadership team, and I'll introduce you in a few minutes. There's uh, no doubt that with AI, we're at a historic moment in time um, that presents a wonderful opportunity to take advantage of uh, the capabilities of AI, but with that comes a responsibility to do that in a safe way. And the opportunity is obviously to impact the economy and also to imp improve societal outcomes, um, making use of AI itself. So let me give you a sense on uh, AI. Um, those of you who do not know, I'll say it with great pride, is that the discovery of AI traces right back here to Toronto at U of T in a very small room with no windows. And um, great progress was made through the period of 2012 up to 17 in particular, at which point the Turing Award was uh, awarded to Jeff Hinton and his, his colleagues in recognition of how far they had come. What they did to ensure that the talent that followed them and the pace of research continued was to found Vector. And I'll explain who we are, but essentially our goal is very simple, to uh, support both commerce and governments and others, the uh, society at large, to take full advantage of AI, to become more competitive and drive the outcomes that I mentioned earlier. Um, we do that by engaging with the community, I'll give you a picture of that in a moment, um, to help them take full advantage of advanced AI and techniques and methods to deploy it responsibly and with, with great outcomes, and also to build talent around AI, and we'll talk a little more about that in a short while. This is who we are today. We're a not-for-profit entity, and um, we have a huge license to convene and a mandate to do so amongst a community of large, companies, we've got 30 major sponsors, um, startups and scale-ups, we've got over 200, working with a particular focus on healthcare, we're partnered with 60 uh, institutions in healthcare, and um, working with uh, our network, particularly U of T, University of Waterloo, um, and other uh, ac academic organizations, not just here locally, but across the country as well, and collaborating with our other institutes within the ecosystem here in Canada. We're sponsored by the federal, provincial governments, and also by, by industry through our uh, sponsors. The um, impact that we're having, just to give you a sense, and we're going to talk a lot about use cases, because I would imagine that each of you are coming from a different state, uh, stage of understanding in regard to AI. These are just examples. We'll go into one or two in more depth. But um, we've done a lot of work with, with Roche, Deloitte, and TELUS to better understand long COVID. With CIBC, through COVID, they, along with many of the other banks, had a challenge in what's called drift. Data's, da the relevance of the data they had became less relevant because of the degree of change. TELUS, who's um, a, a sponsor of ours as well, they're in the business of basically working on um, autonomous vehicles, including trains. And we help them use computer vision to much more effectively identify obstacles on the track. Tell us, we're looking at their energy consumption, and we worked with them to figure out how they could reduce it, particularly in their data centers. And with AI, we were able to identify about a 15% or 12% improvement. So that's an example of where it's been deployed. Let me lift the HUD for a moment, because chat GBT4, I think for a lot of people, has left the impression that it's actually quite simple and very, very easy to use, right? You, you download it, you pay your 20 bucks, I think it's now 10, and you get on with it. Um, when you lift the hood, what's really important to understand is that it is very complex underneath. This is a taxonomy, a quick kind of view of all the areas of research that we're involved in. Our particular focus is around fundamental machine and deep learning, um, ensuring that AI is trustworthy, um, a particular focus on health and scientific discovery, and a, a real expertise around uh, generative models. Behind all of that work, uh, as I mentioned, we've got a, a very large community of, uh, of researchers, and these are just some of our faculty members. So for instance, Sonia is particularly focused on text to 3D creation, and she's, uh, she spends a part of her time uh, at NVIDIA as well. Nicola is uh, particularly focused on privacy preserving techniques, and he's very involved with Google in their lab. 
Parvin is very focused on improving breast cancer surgeries with AI. And Alain is focused on materials discovery um, with applications for clean, clean energy and drugs. Now, I'm going to unpack two things. The word AI, and I'll talk about risks associated with AI. There's AI in its, let's call it traditional sense, we've all been using for at least the past 10 years. You interact with it, actually the stats are at least once every six minutes. Um, that's AI. The, um, there has been huge advances made in the technology that underpins ChatGPT4. When it was released, obviously it caught everybody's attention. But actually the work on the elements which include neural networks, transformers, foundational models, natural language processing, all those elements have been underway and, and we lead here in Toronto globally in a lot of that work. That's generative AI. And whereas AI was really a, the predictive machine as we all got to understand it, Gen AI actually generates content and learns using prompts. Now there's a future AI called artificial general intelligence and that's really where it generates content and learns without supervision. So it's a level of intelligence that would be modeled on our brain um, at that level of uh, intelligence. So important to differentiate them and uh, important to call out a fact, which is that on a survey at the start of this year, which was a pulse on intentions to invest in generative AI in this year, 24% um, of companies globally um, had intentions. Tech, 48%. Canada, 5%. So um, we've work to, be, work to do. Now, why all the fuss earlier in the year as ChatGPT4 was released? The research community raised their hand and they basically drew our attention to the fact that the pace of research and adoption of AI had begun to accelerate. Point number one. Point number two is that the expectation of AGI, that future type of AI that I mentioned, the reality that they were also calling out is that that is going to occur, we're going to reach that level sooner than expected. So not 75 years out, maybe 40 years sooner, maybe in this decade or the next decade. So that's what the fuss was about. This is the, from a Canadian perspective, and I, I don't want to um, take anything from what Stefan said, but he basically supported this, that we have a challenge, which is that our labor costs are going up and our productivity is going down. AI can help address that. Now, I, I just want to give you an example. ChatGBT is down lower right-hand side. All of this uh, above it are options, alternatives to ChatGBT4. And you play it back. If you look back to 2019, work has been underway to get to where we are today. So it's not as though it, it's any pop, ChatGPT popped out. They took the capabilities were there, put a wrap on it, put an easy to use interface in front of it and distributed it, expecting out to 100 million people by the end of this year. So I hope I'm putting it all into perspective. Um, a lot of discussion about the existential risks associated with AGI um, and you know, attention being drawn, momentum towards how do we address it, how do we put the right safeguards around it. But what's really, really important is to separate the risks associated with that future evolving or emerging type of AI with immediate risks that are there today that need to be addressed today. And on the left-hand side, you can see, see those risks. So I would say as companies, as organizations operating, your number one risk is brand, reputation, and trust. Because the risks associated with misinformation, privacy and security, bias and fairness, and ha how they can be amplified as you use AI, put your brand and reputation and trust at risk. So there's a, we'll actually talk about how that can be addressed leveraging AI in a few minutes. And then the other is workforce disruption. And it's, I'm sure across, you know, across the group, you're seeing this to various degrees. But the key thing is AI is disruptive to the workforce. It makes it more productive. It's certainly going to create lots of new jobs, but it's not a one for one replacement. And that's a risk that needs to be addressed as well. And then obviously, whatever you create with your AI needs to be auditable, explainable, 
and you need to be able to be transparent about that or else it's going to loop back to undermine trust in you. So what's been done about it, but a lot is underway in terms of um, policy, regulation, and legislation. We can get to talk about it as we have our conversation. And what I also want to leave with you is that we're very involved in advanced research, not just what can be applied now, but looking right out to the frontier. Um, and there's so much more yet to be discovered about AI. Um, and that's very much part of what we work on. So David, who's um, very involved and actually leads the lab for Google, he, in Europe, is one of the top conferences globally where researchers submit their papers to. David won the paper of the year last year and directly associated with his work in text to image diffusion models. Sanya, as I mentioned earlier, working with NVIDIA, and she's got a particular focus on text to 3D creation. And again, we can talk a little more about that. So I want to be, I don't want to over present to you. <laughs> There's so much content here that I think it's important we get to a discussion. So with that, I'm going to ask and introduce each as they, they step up. Um, Cameron, Cameron leads our industry and innovation team. Devil leads our applied engineering team. And Dan leads our research community. Dan. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but I mentioned that um, we took a journey in, uh, here in Toronto, actually in Canada, um, from, gosh, probably going back 10, 20 years ago in the, the discovery around AI uh, through to today. Um, you, could you share your experience along, along that road and uh, just in terms of what were the big milestones, what it felt like to be part of it? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, so first of all, my name is Dan Roy. I'm research director at Vector. I'm an associate professor at the University of Toronto in statistics. It's cross appointments also in computer science and computer mathematical uh, sciences. Um, <clears throat> and my my own research research is on the mathematical side. I'm essentially at the blackboard proving theorems about AI. Uh, so something I'm well known for is uh, building some of the first uh, statistical explanations for why this new era of deep learning works. Uh, so my story starts around 2008 when I'm in the audience at NeurIPS. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't working on deep learning. Deep learning was very unfashionable at that time. Uh, you didn't even get windows in your rooms, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got windows because I wasn't working on deep learning. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and I, 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 uh, I, was, I was doing other stuff, but I, rem I remember a talk where one of like Hinton's uh, my protégés was in the audience presenting some early deep learning stuff, and they were getting like, basically heckled the entire talk. Um, and uh, it, it was easy at that point to dismiss it because they hadn't had that moment. And that moment came in 2012 when uh, Fei Fei Li at Stanford released, or maybe she was at Princeton at that time, released a new data set with a million images. And the challenge was to look at the, for a computer algorithm to look at the image and label the object in the image. Uh, and existing solutions were n nothing interesting, nothing anyone in this audience would be inter interested in. Uh, but at Toronto, in a windowless uh, room, Hinton and two students of his were uh, aiming this technology that Hinton had worked on for decades, uh, that was mostly ignored, uh, at this new task. And they took the error rates from the previous year and cut them in half in that one year. And then subsequent years, more and more progress. And it was and I, I kind of remember it. I was in graduate school. It was a watershed moment where everyone stood up and it was uh, this brand new technology. Um, so two years later, I was on the job market um, looking for my own job in Toronto. It was like an obvious place, one of the top universities in the world for machine learning. Ended up here. Three years later, uh, Vector Institute meant that we we're going to consolidate all of this uh, talent here and invest. And that's been transformative as we've stolen faculty away from top of schools, um, two years later the Turing Award, um, and so now uh, Toronto is one of the key destinations for advanced research in AI. Good, Dan, thanks for sharing, yeah. sharing that journey. Um, Cameron, take, us, take a moment to introduce yourself, but take us to where the rubber hits the road in terms of where AI is being deployed from a use case perspective. Thank you. 
So I'm Cameron Schuler. I lead the industry innovation team, which means we're the ones that interact with industry and research to help industry adopt AI. I got in the field over 15 years ago. It had zero commercial value. There was considered to actually not work when it came to AI, and the field had been dead for decades. So this is a great place to go advance your career, so that's where I went. <laughs> um, but it's been a very fun journey. And so I was one of the authors of what became the Pan-Canadian AI strategy. So Canada was the first country to have an AI strategy, and myself, Joshua Bengio, um, uh, Jeff Hinton, and others actually were the authors of that. So that's a bit on my background. So in terms of how companies benefit from AI, so Canada had made decades and decades of investment in a field that had no commercial values. It turns out we had some good fortune that had have commercial value. So the two things I want to highlight, one is a Toronto-based real estate company called Wahi. And so when you think about it, a lot of people, maybe not the people in this room, but most people are going to have some interaction, which will be the largest financial interaction in their life, and it's going to be real estate. If you think about how that goes, so when I moved to Toronto, it's like, I've got to find a realtor. Who do I talk to? So I'm kind of trying to guess who that is. So why he said, I think we can do a better job. And so we're going to take a look at quantitative and qualitative info to determine who the top performing realtors are. But in addition to that, we're going to take a look at the fields they, they participate in, and we're actually going to be matching people to realtors because we think we're going to get a better outcome from that. So it's a digital company, so they've built all sorts of digital products, but they've never done a recommender system, which is what they were trying to do with us. So they worked with us for six months, developed a recommender system, and that's actually won a, a national award through Canadian Business for Innovation in Real Estate. So we think they're really going to change the way things happen, because they're actually saying, based on who you are and what you're looking for, here's the best realtors for you to work with. And if anyone's had bad realtor experience, I've fired more than one, uh, you can see how this might actually benefit. So that's the first one, and that's a smaller company. Second one I'm going to talk about is not a Canadian company. They're Korea Telecom, KT Corp. And we do, most of our companies are Canadian headquartered, but we do have foreign multinationals as well. So why is KT important to us? They can go anywhere in the world. They're highly technical. In fact, they have one of the best research institutions in the world in Korea. But they came to Canada to learn about generative AI. And why, why did they do that? Well, very specifically, Gen AI is going to underpin every single thing they do. It's going to underpin their strategy. It's going to be how they communicate with their customers. It's actually the nexus of how, that op how the organization operates. So even though they don't participate in the Canadian market, as far as who they sell to, they came here because the expertise is in Canada. And we as Canadians are far too busy saying, oh, shucks rather than beating on our chest and say, Canada is actually the best in the world at these things. Now, we've also, because we're part of an ecosystem, made introductions, and they're actually working with Canadian telcos to make sure that overall the people in the vector ecosystem are better off because they participate in it. Good. Thanks, Cameron. And uh, I think uh, Korean Telecom is a great example of how we take our advanced research in a sandbox led by Devil and his team and collaborating with Dan and his research team. Um, bring the latest in AI to our sponsors, and our sponsors and startups bring in use cases that they're trying to activate. So KT is a great example for out of a collaborative workshop, they went and deployed what, um, what Cameron was describing, and then the other telcos here in Canada are harvesting that back into the Canadian market with some, you know, in the pipeline are some really remarkable AI-enabled products and services that we'll, we'll all get to experience. Dave oh, I'd like to um, take you from back a little from where the rubber hits the road. How do you enable that? Like, there's a huge bridge to the nature and level of research that we're doing, um, and it has to be bridged to where its AI is being deployed. And I know um, just over lunch, I, I was listening to some of the conversation. There's a lot of questions around what are, the, what are the big things you've got to deal with, and data often comes up in that regard. The other is that every, um, every time I've sat down to have a bite to eat with other people, what I've met are experts in terms of um, developing prompts to submit to chat GBT. So maybe you can comment on that as well. So data <laughs> and um, prompt engineering, I think you call it. Yeah. But yeah. introduce yourself for a moment. Thanks, Tony. So I'm Deval Pandya. I head the AI engineering team. And I think there's some commonality on how I got introduced to what 
is now we are calling AI. So it was during my PhD in 2009, 10. And my focus was on actually simulating fluid flows using traditional mathematical methods like computational fluid dynamics. And I heard in, in one of the conferences as well that you know, there is this new breed of techniques which are almost getting a resurgence in, and they're calling it neural networks. And I think my contribution for that PhD was not that neural networks or deep learning can actually solve that problems, but they can do it maybe. Like, you know, so it, it, was a, it was a very subpar thesis, but that was my introduction to deep learning. Uh, at Vector, um, what me and my team do is uh, we have two uh, big uh, goals. One is enabling more ambitious research, so working with the research community and where we can help with uh, all of the engineering that goes into uh, enabling this research. Uh, that's one. And then second is when we see there's a research which is now ready to be applied, how can we take that and build proof of concepts and tools and sandbox as Tony mentioned, and then deliver it to our sponsors and, and SMEs uh, so that they can adapt it much faster uh, than, uh, than, than anywhere else than they could do themselves. Uh, so throughout my, my, my experience has been mostly in the industry on the applied side. And what we call AI has changed, right? When I started, say, 15 years ago, we were calling statistics as AI. And uh, there's been a lot of rebranding, and it has changed. But there are some challenges which are still the same. And this is where engineering comes in. One is about data. For a lot of the sponsors, for a lot of the SMEs, either it is lack of data, or if you are large corporations, is how do you manage your data? And how do you understand what is the value in that data? Because a lot of data is not always a lot of value. And so how much of an effort you have to make in, uh, in, in preparing the foundations of data uh, to benefit from latest and greatest in machine learning. And this is where a lot of engineering effort usually goes into. The second is how do you scale your model? So how do you go from, say, deploying one model, solving one problem, to deploying multiple models, going from one users, as we just mentioned, around like how do you build a system which can handle, say, 100 users to 100 million users in less than a year? And, and that is a huge engineering challenge. And so these are like two specific use cases where a lot of engineering is being applied right now. Um, with, the, with this pre and post GPT era, I guess, after GPT, what has happened is the technology has been made accessible to pretty much everyone who has internet. And with that, there are two major things that are happening. One is that a lot of the trivial tasks are becoming easier and getting augmented. And, and the risk of, say, decision making in those tasks is very, very low. Like example is, give me an itinerary for, for 10 days to Montreal. And it's easy uh, what happens, like maybe I'll go to a place or not. But at the same time, uh, an example which Dan was talking about uh, when we were chatting like a couple of days ago is say, give me a financial portfolio for investment of $2 billion. And actually, in principle, like large language models will give you an answer, uh, but doesn't mean that the answer is right. And so in the high stakes decision making environment, what you ask these models, and that is what like uh, Tony was mentioning called prompt engineering, what are the prompts? which are giving this model is equally important. And so there's a whole field which is now emerging uh, called prompt engineers. And, and in fact, the entire field of AI engineering and what it entails to become an AI engineer is also transitioning a lot from building machine learning systems to interacting with machine learning systems. And I would just end by saying that the time to reskill and hire AI engineers is right now. This wouldn't be, like the time is no better than today because this skill is going to be way more important and it is going to become much more in demand. If you think today machine learning engineers are in demand, that's going to be 10x very, very soon. And in fact, many of the people in tech who are disrupted by software development, for instance, can be done by generative AI very, very effectively, at least the basic work around it. But there's great potential, and it comes back to us as leaders to be responsible about workforce disruption, is an opportunity to redeploy people, and support them in being aware training and um, taking advantage of a lot of these new skills which need experience of the type that people would have had and everybody's learning it so it's right at the outset so a big opportunity in that in that respect um, Dan take us back um, not to the future but looking more broadly around what's available right now with Gen AI so we're you know we're very focused on how do you develop the right, uh, right prompt to put it into the right model using the right data to get the optimum answer? But what else is happening 
that is available right now. Yeah, all right, so obviously everyone is aware of chat GPT. Uh, chat bots are like the most obvious, um, most common thing you probably interface with if you've been playing with AI. Uh, underlying chat GPT is, is a, a model that can take a piece of text and you can ask it to complete it. That piece of text could be the beginning of a book and it will complete the book for you. Um, that technology and like, its limitations or you know, opportunities it provides is not really well understood. It goes back to prompt engineering. Um, a clever way of expressing something could uh, lead to nothing. A tweak on it could lead to exactly what you need. Uh, and so it's very difficult to assess whether these technologies can deliver what you want. The moment you stop looking, your competitor could figure out the right way to prompt these models. It's like a very, uh, it, it, you see this reflected in research as well. Um, where very rapidly you have people who have happened upon the right way to deal with these models are now ascend, uh, kind of ascendant in research, uh, and the old guard are, are, are less important, maybe only through the fact that they garner so many you know, stellar graduate students to come work with them, et cetera. Um, so ChatGPT, as you probably interact with it, is mostly like a text interface. Recently they've expanded this, you can upload an image You've probably seen AI-generated AI images. Like this is really the tip of that. Um, the the possibility of like simultaneously dealing with images, dealing with video, that's come down the the, the line now. Being able to generate movies from prompts, being able to process images, uh, movies, and all that, all this kind of gen generative stuff, it's going to become much more powerful. Um, now, that's that's still really only the tip because the moment. The moment you think about generation, uh, or you can't just think about generation, you want to also think about these things in like feedback cycles, which is taking actions in the real world and using these models to understand what has happened, what could be done, making suggestions for how to achieve goals, etc. Um, OpenAI, you probably all heard of OpenAI, they're the company that launched ChatGPT. Um, you know, that was basically a bunch of ex-Google people. Google's where uh, all this technology was uh, invented, and actually some of the people at Google were U Toronto people uh, who invented this, this, uh, this technology. Um, OpenAI originally wanted to work on RL, and it was too hard, and they gave up on it and did ChatGPT. Now ChatGPT is, is amazing, but RL is potentially, it's like a new avenue, and now people are starting to turn this technology back on RL. RL is a thing that would power your, uh, an agent who's like interacting with you as an assistant and doing complicated multi-step tasks. Um, it's the thing that would maybe drive your car. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's so many things. It's, RL is really a catch-all phrase in AI for anything that where um, if I take an action, it's not, not obvious whether that's the right action I should have taken until much later. Um, so all, these, you know, all this technology for, for, for GPT, et cetera, we don't yet understand how it's going to influence all these problems that we've been stuck on for maybe decades. Um, so it's, it's uh, in research, it's a crazy time, absolutely nuts, um, because our main conference has, when I was a graduate student, there was 800 people in the room when I gave talks, now it's 8,000. Uh, the number of submissions, I think, to the main conference was like 15,000, I mean, it's, it's insane that we have like massive growing uh, 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 pain, uh, and it's only going to get bigger, uh, and I mean, I'm not an engineer, but it's, it's, it's sort of, there's so much possibility. There's so many people working on this. When I talk to students, they're all thinking about it. They're all working on it. Uh, so you're going to have a generation of students coming up who have been learning this stuff, playing with it, and are going to have deep intuitions and potentially disrupt anything. So, on that note. Yeah. <laughs> Th thanks, thanks yeah. very much, Dan. And, and by the way, I, I said up front, we're not going to be humble. Um, you get how large these conferences are, how competitive they are, and we're so proud that David won the paper he did as the top paper at Europe's last year. So well done, Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned, Dan, the word disruption. Yes. So Cameron, help us with that, because the fear of disruption, the anxiety about the risks that AI can, can generate for us all to deal with, um, has, and the researcher's voice earlier in the year, has led to great momentum on policy, legislation, and, reg and regulation around the world. However, none of that comes into effect for a few years. 
And um, what do we do in the meantime, Cameron? And what have we been doing and what need we to do going forward? Hi, Tony, that's a very good question. <laughs> so <coughs> you've heard a lot about research, and research is important because that's where things start from. But what we did earlier this year is we actually published our trustworthy AI safety principles. And why did we do that? Because we believe AI should be human-centric. So in the absence of legislation, it's how should companies actually behave with this? How, how should they deploy it? What are, when you think about the values that are human values and Canadian values, how do we actually align with that? And so uh, not only do we, did we publish those, Canada since adopted a code of conduct, we're the second country in the world to do that, saying if you're using AI, this is how you should use it. In addition to that, we're actually working in different segments. So with Radical Ventures, which is a venture capital firm, we actually um, co-authored and published uh, AI principles for venture capital. In addition to that, we're actually working with financial institutions to say, how do these things actually work in practice? Because it's great to have aspirations. It's great to say this is how it should function. But you really have to figure out how is this actually going to work in the real world? How practical is it? What are the barriers for doing so? and ensuring that you're creating that infrastructure up front. So you're creating something with the thought of where you want to get to your future state. And so again, we think as Canada being a leader in AI, this is one of the incredibly important pieces. Um, we all know that access to healthcare is a problem. Wait times are too high. So we deployed one use case, um, which actually has, it reduces wait times by 15%. It's predictive AI in its nature, it's simply gathering the data associated with through the year and different events to support the prediction of what the nature of intake would be in, in the ER, and with that prediction to better staff it for those windows. And the reduction was 15% in wait times. Taking it forward into actual care, um, the, uh, the use case that we deployed there was just in the area where you have acute patients before going into the ICU. So with monitoring, um, being able to, in real time, predict which of those patients were most likely to be um, admitted to the ICU and um, calling out early and smart interventions. And the reduction in mortality associated with that in this one hospital was 20%. It was 100 patient lives over the window of the actual pilot that was run. And then another use case is looking at um, labor shortage and using the lever of efficiency for clinicians and their staff in recording, it's an administrative procedure, recording the actual interaction that they had, setting up referrals, getting the data together to support the referrals. I spoke to one person over lunch. Their sister works in a similar role, does her day work and then sp spends four hours on administration pretty much every evening and can't take a complete day off. So these are real cases. They've gone through all of the checks and balances in deployment in the hospital environment that any new clinician process would be um, subject to or any new piece of technology being put into the hospital. And not just from a tech and safety perspective, but from an enterprise impact, from an ethics perspective, ensuring that bias and all of those other elements are, are removed. So I hope we've given you a sense overall on how to unpack AI to understand it, where it's been used, what's next, and what we're doing to advance the future on the talent side. I, I think actually one statistic that the group would probably be not aware of is that Toronto and the Toronto area actually as an AI talent hub has, has the highest growth rate over the past five years. It's actually I think 5% growth over the, uh, on an annual ba annualized basis over that time. The Toronto area, as an AI hub, is one of the few AI hubs in the world that has a net inflow of talent. So we're just superbly positioned from a talent perspective. The challenge is how do we <laughs> drive adoption at scale across the country and get over the conservative thinking around the commitment to invest in AI to drive the economic and societal benefits that, um, that you know, we're, we're talking about are absolutely out there. So our largest segment of companies we work with are actually what you're describing. 
uh, we created a program called Fastlane that is meant for Canadian SMEs. And so it goes all the way from um, kind of the discovery piece all the way through to highly technical and depending on what the company needs. And it is actually a program that is funded by the federal government. So there's no cost to the SME that's involved. So I'd be happy to connect with you on that. And it, it goes right, the starting point is building talent in terms of people who understand it. Do you want to talk about our, in, I've spoken about our masters in AI, AI programming, but our intern um, programming would yeah. be relevant as well. So we have something called the Machine Learning Associate Program. And so it's only available to SMEs in Canada, but it's actually, we hire graduates as short-term contractors and second them into the company. And we do it around themes. So we've done computer vision and forecasting are the two things that we've done to date. And that specifically is, um, that's where Wahi benefited. They didn't have that talent, so we could help them find that talent to go work on the particular problem. And the students end up getting hired by the companies as well, or the contractors end up getting hired by the companies as well. And so if you don't have the talent, that's how we can also help you with that. In fact, something we're lucky not doing is how can we scale that to make it more accessible and uh, you know, broaden our reach as interest and demand increases. So the Fascinating Program's open to everybody. When it comes to the Machine Learning Associate Program, it's going to be topic specific. So it's not, it, people are going to have to have a particular type of problem inside of their company. So ultimately, if we're working on forecasting, then the companies will intake into that are going to have forecasting problems that they want to solve. But we do rotate through some of those. And we've just finished, or we're just halfway through our third cohort of, of that program. So. Highly caution against using something like ChatGPT as the single source of truth. It is not a single source of truth. Uh, it is a highly capable model which can generate text. It can answer a lot of questions. But as with any individual, right, like we know only based on what our experiences have been and what we have learned throughout, it's very similar with the model itself. So model knows everything until the date of its training data. And OpenAI will be continuously updating that. Uh, but it is not, I would highly caution against using it as a search engine or, or as a, a single source of truth. Uh, what is it highly capable of? It, it is say it is capable of generating language and now generating like uh, uh, images and and a lot of other tasks, right? Uh, but uh, when you think of say, oh, is this um, if you're using something like ChatGPT uh, as a source of current information, uh, it is not. Uh, a problem on the bleeding edge of research at the moment is uh, to allow these models to make use of tools. Uh, so, you know, for it to, you know, not to like try to memorize inside of its weight how Excel works, but to let it, literally let it interact with Excel. Uh, and so, uh, you know, how people are somewhat bringing, uh, you know, live information to the fold is to combine these machines with like live search or live scraping of data. And then, um, actually these machines are in some sense like much more performant when you're asking them questions about things that are provided in prompt. And some of the, you know, some of the largest models will allow you uh, 100,000 tokens. You can think about tokens like a part of a word. Maybe you know, a normal word is like one or two tokens or something like that. Um, so these token window sizes mean that you can say upload a few PDF documents and, and talk about that PDF document or like have information about a recent event. So that's that's one way to extend extend the capabilities of these systems. Um, yeah. Dan, w one one area that it comes up and it. Um, is unrelevant to what you're talking about. H how, how do we balance innovation with ensuring that data privacy isn't breached or even IP is not breached? Yeah, so I mean, if you're, you, I mean, I think, I think in the term, I mean, maybe they've changed, but I think the terms of service for chat GPT is like, what you type into chat GPT is open AIs. If you pay for GPT access, which is the technology underneath chat GPT, then I think that there are aspects of that API where you're guaranteed or you're promised that they won't use your data. Now, if I were, you know, Google does not allow their employees to use <laughs> GPT, despite the promise they're not going to use the data for obvious reasons, right? Uh, you know, and if you are competing with one of those companies, maybe you'd have uh, concerns as well. Um, so, you know, there's a cottage industry now of people like highly talented, often ex PhDs, who have trained a bunch of these models who will now, for much less than opening eyes spent, uh, help you train up your own. Or now there's a large number of uh, open source models, your team's much more expert than I am on these, uh, that uh, researchers have released. And 
These are not GPT-4 quality models, uh, but for your task, with a little bit of fine tuning, which means bringing some of your own data to bear, some of your own problems to bear, and, and, and you can uh, do a bit more training on the same model. Uh, not enough, you know, not so much compute that you'd have to spend $20 million, but uh, you know, uh, something, something much cheaper than that. You can poten potentially, and people have demonstrated this, come up with a model that is superior to GPT-4 on your narrow domain. So that's like very much possible. And that could be something that's housed inside your company uh, on all your own hardware, never mind cloud or anything like that. I think it, you have to start with the business problem. And you have to start with what the core of your business is. Right. If your core of your business is technology and you're competing with uh, OpenAI like, like Google is, uh, you obviously don't want to use OpenAI and, and start sharing. There was actually an incident where a bunch of proprietary code from Amazon ended up on like, uh, ChatGPT because like, and then they had to like, put guardrails on who's using it, right? But let's say you're a small and medium enterprise who wants to look at what is the best marketing trends right now. Uh, what is the value? This is, goes back to the thing. What is the value of your data? And privacy, just for the sake of privacy, uh, is, is not the best answer. And so what is the, say, that balance between privacy and utility of your data is something which is very business specific and you have to think about it from a business value proposition perspective. So um, let me share something with you that we had on our agenda. We weren't sure whether we could get to the topic, <laughs> um, which is think about when cars were introduced, governments, as adoption increased, built highways. Actually, when people got their mind really around education at scale, schools were built. I can go on and on. Um, AI requires national infrastructure for a country to get full benefit out of it. There's two dimensions to that conversation, which is actually starting to gain great momentum here in Canada, although we're following other countries who've figured it out and are deploying it at this stage. Um, which is the importance of a national infrastructure that ensures compute accessibility, particularly for small to mid-sized startups, small to mid-sized companies and research. Um, large businesses you know, have the weight to negotiate with big tech in an affordable way to them to access it. So the view is that we need national infrastructure that provide, provides that compute capability and accessibility. Um, and it has to be Canadian-wide accessibility or you get all sorts of disruption in terms of inequity just because you're living in a remote place. Um, the other component of that infrastructure discussion is data, national data, that if unlocked, permitted in a way that is responsible, health being a good example, um, that a country can take even better advantage of AI particularly for societal good. And you can play that right through from healthcare to agriculture, through to addressing climate change, like forest fires, being able to predict them more effectively. Um, I can go on and on, but right now there's an emerging discussion around national infrastructure that supports both compute and data for the reasons that I mentioned. Um, we had the opportunity to spend time in South Korea, actually at a, an APAC conference at which then we were doing the keynote speech, but the, um, each country in APAC presented its national strategy. Every one of them, including China, had those elements in their national infrastructure to enable their AI strategies. So we don't have to prove the case, we just need to get, catch up and get on with it. That's a very good question, and I, as, like, it's a geopolitical question. I, we see like we had an expert in the room, but I mean, Dr. Stai just, just left. I, I think one of the big risks which we are seeing is uh, we are currently dependent for hardware on, on a single, almost pretty much on a single entity. I was, I was talking to one of our friends in, um, in, in, in VC in Europe, and, and he basically joked that you know, we are funding startups to funnel money back to NVIDIA, right? Like, which is, which is an actual problem, but we are seeing there's a lot of hardware innovation coming up, right? We are seeing uh, already established country companies like, like Intel and AMD are going to step up to provide some alternatives, but we're also seeing new breed of companies like Cerebras, and so there are a bunch of different hardware companies which are uh, kind of coming up, and so one way is to just diversify and work on how do you, how, how these models can actually be trained and used on diversified hardware. The second is where I'm very enthusiastic about is there is, there is a breed of 
engineers and researchers working actually very actively, uh, all of it in open source domain, on saying how do we train such large models on internet speeds, on, on uh, distributed uh, hardware and non-homogeneous hardware. Uh, and so that is, I think that is a very active area of, of research where ideally you could train these models uh, on your cell phones and someone's GPUs and M1 chip on a, and all of it together through, through internet, right? And so there is also methods research in terms of how that can distributed computing research uh, happening. Uh, currently, there is, I think the real answer is getting the queue to buy A100s. But, uh, but you have to, while you're waiting in the queue, you want to kind of uh, diversify your strategy. Dan, you probably have a perspective. Yeah, I just want, I want to follow that up. So, so, you know, Vector has multiple pieces to it. We have the industry facing part, we have the engineering teams, we have the research side. Uh, all these work together. So we have, we have leading researchers working on the next generation of technology within, uh, within Vector. Uh, to return to the gentleman Pryor's point about combining models, uh, you know, there, there's technology like available and also we have researchers working on the technology you need to like have two entities that have trained or fine-tuned their model on their own data come together and combine their models. Uh, and combine a model, their models presumably in a way, or you know, the, the goal is in a way that doesn't share the data, but it shares the capabilities. Uh, and so you can even, you know, and we have theoreticians working on ways to prove mathematically that, uh, to do this in such a way that provably, you have a theorem that says, and no data is shared in that interaction. So we have all these things at operating at very different scales in research. Uh, and the gap between, you know, uh, something in research and something in development, um, of course, has a lot to do with how much it's needed and the potential impact as well. So we've seen that shrink. Uh, but it's like one part of why it's so important for Vector to have, be affiliated with over, you know, we have 40 faculty, we have 100 additional affiliated faculty, and in total, including all of our graduate students, 700 researchers working in the physical space. Good. Thank you, Dan. Um, we've got three minutes left. Uh, thanks for all the questions, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists to give us just their one last thought before we wrap up. So, Dan, over yeah. to you. Uh, my, I guess my one, my one thought is that, you know, I think more so than any technology, it's really not clear what this can do for you, just because we know so little about what Deval and, and Tony were talking about uh, when they said prompt engineering, which is like, you can think about this as like an alien technology that's come down and it's associated with a program, programming language, but we don't know the programming language. Uh, and there's a possibility that, I mean, any day, and this happens, you, uh, someone makes an innovation in how you prompt these models and opens up all this new, all this new capabilities. So, I mean, I would advise you to start building up that expertise inside your company because you're, they were, they're going to be the ones that are going to be able to absorb this rapid advancement and immediately deploy it. It's also often very easy to deploy these tweaks. Uh, anyway, I just want to mention Thanks, John. I'm going to keep these guys on their toes. Come yeah. over to you first. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Dan took my point. Uh, I, it really has to be a high priority. This is, this is something that will enable you to be more efficient. And if you don't use it, your competitors are going to be. So it has to be at the very top of your priority list in terms of adoption of AI in your business. Thanks, Cameron. Devil. Yeah, I, I'll just emphasize. I mean, the biggest risk is not uh, adopting AI, and we do need guardrails. I wish I, this was my original kind of uh, quote, but I heard one of our colleagues say a thing which, which I would just repeat and say, let's not be afraid of guardrails because, like, brakes help us go faster in our car, right, if you think of it. And so there will be, like, guardrails and regulations, but if we embrace that, it will help us move faster. And unlike, I think, the previous... Uh, uh, tech innovation mantra of move fast, break things. I think we have to move fast, but not break things, right? Thanks, Javal. Well, as we said several times, um, we're living in what's recognized as one of the top AI hubs in the world, and this panel is reflective of that talent. So thank you very much. <laughs>